It is my pleasure to introduce to you our speaker today. Um, he has come to our campus with lots of experience in college ministry down from Pepperdine and most recently a lot of church ministry out in Denver. And he has come here to share his heart with you guys, to share what God has put um, in him to share about our theme and kick that off. And it's going to be so good. So it is my pleasure to introduce to you my boss, my friend, your campus pastor, T. Fizzy, Thomas Fitzpatrick. <laughs> Thanks, Angel. <clears throat> Warriors, what's up? Uh, good to be with you guys. I'm sure you've heard this a thousand times the last couple days, but man, I'm so glad that you are back in this place. Hopefully you thoroughly enjoyed your holiday break. Hopefully you're able to sleep until 2 or 3 p.m. every day, uh, consume large quantities of fruitcake or eggnog, binge watch some Netflix. Anybody do anything exciting on the break? Okay. Maybe a random, awkward combination of all three of those things at the same time. I don't know. Anyway, hey, it's, uh, it's hard to come back from the holidays. I totally get that. Hard to start school uh, again. But I'm personally stoked that you guys uh, are back here with us. For one, right after I started this job last semester, y'all just up and left. I, I tried to take it personal, but it kind of hurt. Like right here. It's like, oh, man, did I say something? Was it me? Did I stink? Like, what happened here? So the fact that you're back uh, ministers to my heart. I feel a lot better about myself. So thank you. Thank you so much for that. Hey, in all honesty, though, I am stoked that you're back because I have this sense, and Blake talked about it a little bit on Monday night at Student Led Chapel. I have a sense that God is doing something this semester, that there's going to be some breakthrough and some really powerful victories in Jesus' name experienced by a lot of students here. I think that's true for, for a lot of you. You might not think that that's true for you, but I, I really do. For some of you, this is your very first semester here. Everybody say, newbie. newbie. Okay, not everybody. It was like five guys here in the front. Everybody say, newbie. newbie. Okay, if you are new, would you just raise your hand for us? This is your very first semester here. Like, we're so glad that you were here. We're so glad that you were here. Hope that you already feel like you are a huge part of this place. God brought you. I know it might feel weird halfway through, feel like you're on the outside looking in, or everybody's already got their circles of friends, already doing their thing. That's not true. We need you here. The Lord brought you here for a very specific purpose. So, so do not let the enemy lie to you, make you think that you're an you're outsider. You're a, you're a huge part of this community. Uh, for others of you, like our seniors, this is quite possibly your last semester here. Yeah. Every, everybody say, aww. Or the seniors are like, no, 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 you can celebrate that, right? You can go ahead and celebrate that. For some of you, like our athletes, this might be your most productive semester. This might be your most successful, a huge breakthrough for you on the court or on the field. Everybody say, warrior strong. And for others of you, this might be the semester you find your passion or your calling or you finally pick a major. And all the professors say amen to that, right? The professors say that. So I just want to pray just for a second as we begin this semester off. We would ask the Lord to, to do what he's promised to do, which is give us breakthrough and victory uh, this count. Let's pray. God, we lift up all of the different student groups we just mentioned and all the ones in between to you right now in this moment. Would you bless and anoint and powerfully move through our freshmen, through our sophomores, through our juniors, through our seniors, God, through our athletes, through our drama group, through our science division, through our education department. God, would you move through all of them and, and help every student here to experience a breakthrough a victory that they've been hoping for and praying about for so long. We pray 2019 is the year all that comes about. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. I don't know how it is here at Jessup, but the first few days of a new semester, at least when I was back in college, were some of my favorite because they were relatively easy. They were more or less syllabus days. Is that kind of how it is here at Jessup, right? You just kind of go through the syllabus, talk about what's expected of you throughout the semester, and then you call it good. Now, granted, I was a communication major at a rather large state school. Okay, a few of you. There's a book out there called What to Do Now That You Have a Communication Degree. We'll talk about that, okay? Um, but, but I was a communication major, so it was never too terribly complicated on syllabus day. It was like a speech here, a presentation there, yada, yada, yada. Like, prof, is that it? Can, can we leave? Uh, I imagine here at Jessup, if you're a chemistry major uh, or, or some other science, maybe physics, math, syllabus day can be rather terrifying. Is that true? If you, like, flip through that thing, like, oh, snap. Like, there goes my life. I just heard it, like, walk out the door, right? Uh, any, any chemistry majors in here? Raise your hands. No, they're studying, right? They're already in the library, like, doing their thing. If, if someone just raised their hand next to you, just lay your hands on them and just pray for them real fast. Uh, I cannot imagine what it would be like. Uh, but let me ask you a question. What if there was a syllabus for life? 
I mean, what if at some point in your young adult years, someone handed you this stack of papers, this list of things that you were expected to accomplish and do over the next like, 60 to 80 years of your life? What would, what would be on a list like that? Well, based on all the advertisements that I see, based upon what I hear from you guys talking about, based upon what I hear your parents talking about, the list isn't all that complicated. Uh, the expectation for you is that you'd finish college, uh, get a good job, like move out of the basement, like not sleep around, uh, marry a good Christian person, adopt some super cute dog from the rescue shelter, right? like, like serve as a parking lot attendant or a greeter at your church, have a few well-behaved straight-A students, like coach Little League soccer or t-ball because you have to. Right? Is, this, is it like the expectations for you? Uh, buy a bunch of junk you don't really need that's going to break. Uh, join a country club. Cruise the country in an RV. Are you with me? This is, this is what the world is putting on life's syllabus for you. And when you check these things off and when you like, do these things, you succeed. You pass life. But, but then you die. It's like, okay, well, what just happened? But how would that list, all the things that I just mentioned to you, how would that list stack up against, against Christ's expectations for you in this life? How would the world's syllabus compare to the Savior's syllabus? Because I think he has one. I don't think it's a what-if question. I think he has literally laid out for us his expectations and his hopes. And we could talk all year about what those are. I just want to point one thing out to you as we begin this semester. It's in Exodus 34, 5 and 7. It will be on the screen. Then the Lord came down in the cloud and stood there with him and proclaimed his name, the Lord. And he passed in front of Moses, proclaiming, The Lord, the Lord, the compassionate and gracious God, slow to anger, abounding in love and faithfulness, maintaining love to thousands and forgiving wickedness, rebellion, and sin. If you really want to get to know somebody, just ask them, Hey, would you tell me about yourself? Just tell me about yourself. Let, let them do the talking. This is exactly what the Lord does in this particular passage. He takes the initiative to describe who he is to a guy named Moses. And he uses these great words, these great phrases, this amazing terminology. But there's one phrase in particular I want to point out. And it's abounding in love. The Lord, the Lord, the compassionate, gracious God, slow to anger, abounding in love. Everybody say abounding in love. Again, abounding in love. This is how God describes himself. God, tell me about yourself. Who, who are you, God? What are you like? He says, I am abounding in love. Now let's make sure that we understand exactly what that means. Webster's Dictionary defines abound in this way. To have or possess in great quantity. To have or possess in great quantity. In other words, when you abound with something, when you abound in something, you don't just have a little baby, teeny, tiny bit of it. You have an excessive, over-the-top, extreme, outrageous amount of it. Right, as the cool kids up here in NorCal say, you have a heck of a lot of it, right? You had a heck of a lot of that thing. You might explain it like this. Uh, the, the orchards abound with different kinds of apples. Or the guys in Duck Dynasty abound in different kinds of facial hair. Right? Or Mark Wahlberg, ladies, abounds in different kinds of muscles. Like, we understand that to be true. I had some pictures. They might have been X-rated, though. So, chapel guys, they, they just pulled the plug. Uh, but the greatest example of this is that our God abounds in love and faithfulness and mercy and kindness and power and authority and creativity and, 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 and. You with me? He abounds in all of these things. He doesn't just have a little bit of these things. He abounds in them. He has outrageous quantities of these things. God has more love for you than you could ever fathom it's because he abounds in love. He has more grace than you could ever ask for or need because he abounds in grace. He has more power than you could ever fully utilize or exhaust because he abounds in power. That's what it means to abound. He has these things in great quantities. And here's the thing, my friends. The Bible makes it clear that the children are supposed to look like the father in this regard. The children are supposed to look like the father when it comes to this. I just noticed this the other day. I've been a pastor for a long time, and I never noticed how much the scripture talks about us abounding in things. Let me, let me point a couple out to you. Philippians 1.9, this is my prayer, that your love may abound more and more in knowledge and depth of insight. Colossians 2, 6 and 7. 
So then, just as you received Christ as Lord, continue to live in him, rooted and built up in him, strengthened in the faith as you were taught, abounding with thankfulness. 2 Corinthians 1.5, for just as we share abundantly in the sufferings of Christ, so also our comfort abounds. I'm like, geez, it abound is everywhere. He wants us to abound in all kinds of things. Then the last passage, uh, 2 Corinthians 8.7, but as you abound in everything, in faith, speech, knowledge, diligence, in your love for us, see that you abound in this grace also. The list goes on and on. The God who abounds in love the God who abounds in faithfulness, the God who abounds in mercy and grace and generosity and joy and passion and creativity, he calls his children to abound in those very same things. God doesn't want you to just have a little bit of these things, to experiencing these things you know, every once in a while on your best of days in a worship setting where you get the Holy Spirit goose bumps. Like, oh yeah, I felt joy. I don't know, he wants you to experience it all the time. He wants you to have it in excessive quantities. Think about this with me. God would not send his son to die an agonizing death on the cross and then go through all of the work of replacing your spirit with his so you could have a little bit more joy than the average person. He'd go through all of that work so you could just have a little bit more? No, no, no. He went through all of that work so you would abound in joy. So you would have so much joy that even when your parents go through a divorce, even when their relationship ends really poorly, even when things don't turn out the way that you want, you still have joy. Because you abound in joy. You don't have a little bit of it. You have it in great quantity. See, God wouldn't send his son to die an agonizing death for you and then go through all of the work of replacing your spirit with his so you could have a little bit more gratitude than the average person in this world. Just a little bit more. So you'd say thank you a few more times outside of like Thanksgiving and the end of the semester. Right? He, he wants you to abound in gratitude. He wants you to have so much gratitude that you give praise even in the storm. You get praised even when you're locked up in prison. You get praised no matter what in every season, in every moment, because you abound in gratitude. You don't just have gratitude when things work out. You have it all the time. You have it in extreme quantities. God wouldn't send his son to die an agonizing death on the cross and then go through all of the work of replacing your spirit with his so you could have a little bit more hope than the average person. Just a little bit. No, no, no. He did all of that hard work so you would abound in hope. So you'd have so much hope. I mean, it seeps out in every moment, in every season. When you're hurting, when you're feeling lonely, when someone you love passes away and is taken from you. When you struggle with that same stupid sin again and again and again. You know what? You abound in hope in that moment. Because you don't have just a little bit of hope. you got excessive quantities of hope. God wouldn't send his son to die an agonizing death on the cross. And then go through all of the hard work of replacing your spirit with his. So you could have a little bit more power than the average person in this world. Just a little bit more power. He did all of that hard work so you would abound with power. So you would have power to do things this world has never seen the likes of. That's why he did what he did. Not so you could have a little bit more power, so you would abound with power. Are you following me? Are you with me on this? Jesus didn't come to the earth so you could have a little bit more of him. He came so you could have all of him. All right, uh, I'm a big object lesson guy, so I'm going to try to explain this to you. I'm going to invite a friend up here. Manda, come on up here. Manda from Student Activities. Give it a hand for Amanda. Okay, here's our object lesson right here. Okay, Manda, I'm going to give you love in the form of this balloon. And I want you to uh, keep the balloon afloat. And, uh, and when it drops, you're out of love. Okay? okay, so there's love. Here's some peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Did we good? Okay. Awesome. Okay. All right. One out of seven or eight. All right. Not, not too bad. But, but isn't, that, isn't that what most of our lives look like, if, if we're truly honest? We're trying to manufacture these qualities and these traits of the Lord. Like, I'm happy. See, I'm happy. Like, like I'm really joyful. I'm kind to my, my younger siblings. I forgive the roommate that, like, messed up everything in the room. Like, like I'm nice to the teacher that was really, uh, you know, whatever. We try to manufacture these things, and then what happens? We, we drop them. It, does, it doesn't work out well because we're trying to produce and keep them afloat on our own power. We're trying to be like, God, you are good, so I have to look good. For the, for the world to believe in you, I have to look like you're real. I have to prove through my own life that, that you are real somehow. So I'm just going to manufacture and try to produce all these different traits and characteristics. 
And then what happens, we drop one. And what happens when you drop one, you focus so much on it that you end up kind of dropping all of the other ones as well. And suddenly, poor Amanda, everybody say, aw, she don't have any God left in her. <laughs> Hold on. What if I just said, Amanda, here you go. <laughs> Let me just give you all those things, and, and you don't have to work hard to achieve them, right? What if you could have joy without all the effort? What if you could have, have, have power without, like, gritting your teeth and saying, I'm powerful? What if you could have hope without, like, faking it? What if you could honestly say, I got all this stuff, but it's not infused by my power. It's infused with the Holy Spirit's power. It's not, it's not about me manufacturing and keeping all these things like, I'm happy, I'm joyful, I'm patient, I'm kind, see, 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 see. Oh, no, what was that? Faithfulness. Oops. Let's just, let's just have all of them. And let's have them be infused with a different power. Are you with me? Man, you can take that home with you because I don't want it in my office anymore. You're so welcome. Awesome. You're welcome. There you go. But this is why. Think about this with me just for a second. This is why. Some of you, like, snap in this random moment, and you're not exactly sure what happened. A, a friend comes up and says, hey, can I, can I borrow a textbook real fast? And you, like, flip off the handle. You're like, borrow my textbook. Oh, I bought this textbook. And are you going to highlight it? Are you going to write in it? I need the textbook. I, I can't fail the class. Why don't you go buy your own textbook, you lazy, you know, whatever. Like, Ugh. like, what just happened? Like, okay, cool, I'll go to the library. What happened? You were doing all this. And then suddenly, kindness just dropped out, and everybody around you felt it. And then you realized it, and you were so upset about that, then all of a sudden, love just kind of fell out over here. And you were so upset about that, and then patience dropped. I mean, just that's just how we work, but that's not how God wants it to be. You were not meant to experience these things in limited quantities. You were not meant to experience these things on your own power. You're not meant to manufacture these things. You were made to abound in these things. You're made to have them in great, crazy quantities. How? How is this going to work? Romans 15, 13. Now, may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing, here we go again, that you may abound in hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. You will give up this ridiculous looking game as soon as you say, Holy Spirit, I need you. You will give up balancing, producing, manufacturing all these qualities, you will give that up as soon as you say, Holy Spirit, you got to take control. I was trying to find one of those huge, like, helium tanks. I was going to roll it out here with a big, like, Holy Spirit. So I'm like, here he is, Holy Spirit. But then I was afraid some of you would be like, <laughs> right? Like, no, don't do that. You abound in joy. You abound in patience. You abound in goodness. You abound in love. You abound in faith by the power of the Holy Spirit. That's where a lot of us have gone wrong. We think as a Christian, it's up to us to produce. He's like, Jesus started it off, but now we have to make it or fake it. That's not, that's not how it has to be. Instead of relying on your own power, just ask God, would you fill me with your power? Jesus says this, even though you who are evil, even though you know how to give good gifts, your heavenly Father, who is perfect, will give you, remember how he finishes the statement? The gift of the Holy Spirit. When Jesus is talking about a good gift that your, that your God could give to you, at the top of his list is the gift of the Holy Spirit. Why? Because the Holy Spirit is that power that will fill you to an abounding level with all of those traits and characteristics. You want more peace? Then ask the God who abounds in peace to give you his spirit of peace. Do you want more joy? Then ask the God who abounds in joy to give you his spirit of joy. Do you want more authority? Then ask the God who abounds in authority to give you the spirit of authority. Do you want more faithfulness? Then ask the God who abounds in faithfulness to give you a spirit of faithfulness. You with me? Our God is an abounding God. He possesses all of the things we could ever want or desire in great quantity. So just ask him for it. Ask him for it. Go to him and say, fill me up. You want love so badly. You are running like a chicken with your head cut off, seeking love, trying to manufacture love, trying to produce love. Stop it. Get on your knees and ask for the spirit of love. 
Some of you want peace so bad. You're like, you know, you're doing yoga and you're taking all these extra things. You're doing oils all over your body, whatever. <laughs> Try to find some peace, like stress away and this away and that away. Get on your knees and ask for the spirit of peace. Some of you want power. You want to do great things in this world. And so you think it's your GPA or your resume or your pedigree or your performance, whatever. Stop it. Get on your knees. Ask for a spirit of power. Our God abounds in these things. And he wants his children to do the same. All you got to do is ask the Father. There's a song Jesus Calls just came out with a couple, couple months back called Defender. Anybody know Defender? <laughs> so good. And it says, all I had to do was praise. All I had to do was worship. Guys, I know this sounds so weird. All you got to do is ask. And so this semester, our hope for you throughout chapel is that we would just kind of dive into this topic of, of a bound, that we would see what this looks like. We, we, would, we would hear from different speakers as to how this happens, what, what the prayer maybe sounds like, what, what your life looks like when you finally are infused with the power and you stop doing this whole thing. Some speakers will probably speak directly to it. Others will be somewhat tangential, whatever. Let's just pray that God will teach us to abound. God will show us what it means to abound. Because here's the thing, and then we'll, we'll end in one final song. I'm going to ask the band to come up real fast. The people who are going to change this world for good, the people who are going to change this world for God are not going to be the ones who just have a little bit of kindness. They're going to be the ones who abound in kindness. The ones who change this world for good, the ones who are going to change this world for God are not going to be people who have a little bit of patience. It's going to be those who abound in patience, who have extreme excessive amounts of it. Those who are going to change this world for good, those who are going to change this world for God are not going to have a little bit of love. They're going to abound in love. You're not going to have a little bit of faithfulness. You're going to abound in it. You're going to have a little bit of self-control. You're going to abound in it. That's what it's going to take to change the world is to abound in these qualities. You ever been around somebody who abounds in something? Like, man, that guy is just always happy. Like that, that girl is just so full of joy all the time. That person gives so much, yet she wants to keep giving more and more and more and more and more. That person is so holy, yet thinks they're not so mean. You ever seen that before? It's because they're tapping into it. They're starting to understand it's not about this. It's about this. Like, I got it. I'm running out of it. Psh, got it again. I pray that we will abound. Because if an entire community like this abounded in the fruits of the Spirit, man, watch out. Some incredible things happen. Let me pray us out. We'll sing a song called Pieces, uh, referencing and referring to the idea that God's not going to give you just a little baby bit. God's going to give it all because that's who he is. That's what he does. Let's pray. God, we are so grateful that you are a God that doesn't have just a little bit of love for us because that would probably run out. We're so grateful that you don't have a little bit of grace because we mess up so much it would definitely run out. We're so grateful that you don't have a little bit of faithfulness because our faithfulness, it runs out. And we're just so grateful that yours doesn't. And we're so grateful that you are a God who abounds in things like peace and love and faithfulness and joy and gratitude and power and authority and patience. God, you abound in those things. You have them in excessive, extreme quantities. And we as your children want to look like you, our Father. We want to abound in those things as well. Yet many of us have been trying to do it on our own accord. We've been trying to act like we are those things, trying to produce those things, trying to manufacture those things. Help us to stop. Help us just to ask for your Holy Spirit to come and give us what we cannot produce on our own. Help us to be people that are so filled with you that it is obvious to an unbelieving world. Help us, God, now to not simply abide, to be with you, but in, instead to be filled with you and to go do great things for you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Let's stand and sing one final song together.